Hello and welcome to the Juana Juana podcast. If you're enjoying the show, consider signing up for the Patreon. There you get ad-free content, early access, exclusive episodes, and monthly supporter hangouts. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Juan on Juan podcast. If you don't like the subscription-based models, there are other ways of supporting the show that are linked in the description. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this episode. They said it was forbidden. They said it was dangerous. They were right. Introducing the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual. Dive into the arcane, into the hidden corners of the occult. This isn't just a comic. It's a hidden tome of supernatural power. All original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of Juan Ayala, one of the only living homunculologists of our time. Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus, ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day, knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart, available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today. Welcome to the One on One podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. adjusted to a sick society is no measure of good health and then attempting to make sense of this place based on the opinions of others about you all of these kind of concepts just like melt away and they just go away so again uh with this then i would say that the only real belief that i have i have one if anything that i can identify right now and that is the the idea and the concept of temporary truths just something i've been thinking about talking about for a while that really what is offered here is temporary truth that's it that's what you get you get a temporary amount of time to feel so certain about something before it changes and if you're willing to go through that with flow and with ease and with an attachment then it's an actually an incredibly expansive process because you're able to move through air quotes belief systems really really easily because you're like oh okay cool i see the value in there i'm going to move on with it not say it's it was all bull because you walk through the room you enjoy the museum exhibit and you move on to the next room some people hang out in the same room forever and yell at you for going to any other room or telling them about any other room that you visited within this museum and it's fine but really when you when it comes down to it and when you're when you're talking about sort of this idea of this realm in in general really worldview plays a ton into the concepts of aliens and extraterrestrials and what they are Welcome back to another episode of the One on One Podcast. I'm your host, as always. Make sure to follow the show on social media at the One on One Podcast, tjojp.com. And chosenjuan.com is the newest where you can sign up for the Kickstarter for the newest issue of The Chosen Juan. Also, if you want to call in, be featured on the show, 407 476 4606, 407 476 four six zero six and joining us today i've been on his show he's got great stuff interesting guy for the first time ever brandon welcome to the podcast what's up bro what's up dude grateful to be here glad to have you man can you let the people know where they can find your podcast any websites you want to plug anything that you want the people to to go look at Sure. Uh, Websites linked everywhere, expandingrealitypodcast.com. She is under construction right now. We are adding events to that, which we're doing our hosting our first event in Blairsville, Georgia, which we can talk about in May. And so for now, expandingrealitypodcast.com will be back up soon. So you can go ahead and put that one in your pocket and hang on to it. Other than that, any way the podcast can be found, Uh, YouTube, Rockfin, uh, I think BitChute, uh, Odyssey, all that kind of stuff. Um, All the listener apps run like 40 something different listener apps. 
and uh, all of that kind of stuff as well. Uh, we can find the journal series. We have a publishing house called Rediginal Publishing, and that is a word I made up. I figured all words are made up. So I'm like, hey, look at there. Thank you. Look at that plug, dude. Uh, all words are made up, so I do my do my damnedest as well. Rediginal uh, represents ridiculously original, and that's our thing is to uh, amplify and empower the voices of ridiculously original authors and creators. And with that, we've done this amazing journal series, which we can also talk about. I hand drew all that stuff, and it's a big community project in many parts. Um, next ones are right behind it on the way. So we have the show, the events, the publishing, and uh, just crushing, man. Everything's just going awesome. I keep daring, you know, the universe, which I think is spelled incorrectly in the mainstream. It's Y O U. You know, I keep daring it to uh, up its game, and it seems to do that and take me up on it. So it's been fun. What got you started in? Because I know you talk about pretty much, you cover a lot of topics that I cover the occult, mysticism, spirituality, simulation, all that stuff. What got you started as far as these topics, the esoteric? What, what what did it for you, bro? Man, I uh, 18 years old. I was um, 17, honestly, put in an interesting situation. I was grown, I was born and raised in a small suburb. It wasn't like on a ranch or anything. It was a small suburb in North Texas called Keller, Texas. And right now, if you look it up, it's like 5A and big. But when I was there, it was 3A and small. We had like 60 people in my graduating class. I was completely sheltered. We did the church everyday thing. Um, parents incredibly into that. And, um, you know, had a cool thing going all the way through 17 and a half years old when we had a job transfer that took me down to Houston with the rest of my family. And so from a very small town, 65 people graduating class, up, didn't know anything, didn't know what pot was, didn't catch any of the drug, re drug references, really very sheltered in a way just simply because I was just ignorant, right? I just wasn't exposed to it. So uh, we moved down to Houston, uh, That all of that changed. So uh, for a year and a half, my junior year, all the way through my senior year, which is what I've spent in Houston, this was now a thousand something graduating class. Um, it was a big, big, big culture shock and transition. There are people from all over the world in Houston. It's a big melting pot. And I just met people and saw things and heard things I'd, you know, this small town boy had never heard. So completely sheltered 17 and before. Uh, moving to Houston, though, was the biggest awakening I've ever gotten. Um, uh, one of my parents had a big issue with it, and so it became physical in the house. And to keep it off the brothers, I just kept being me naturally, and it stayed on me, which was great. Um, from then, it escalated to um, right after I'd taken acid for the first time. So I was introduced to uh, psychedelics for the first time ever in the form of liquid acid at the age of 18. And I um, then uh, began to explore the world of psychedelics in that way. And that was mind blowing to see this interconnectivity between everything and to really feel this oneness and then to have this other going on at home and to where that was falling apart. And so I started being pulled in interesting directions. I started, um, I was waiting tables at Chili's as a high schooler. I was 18, I had birthdays in September. They just decided to do it the next year, right? And so I started waiting tables. I meet this guy, introduces me to my conspiracy mind. like. I'd always felt something, you know, wasn't right, but just kind of ho-hummed through it. In Houston, I started getting really exposed to that asking questions was a cool thing, getting exposed to comedians in the form of George Carlin and um, Dave Chappelle's early stuff, uh, Bill Hicks, things like that, which I considered philosophers and continued to listen to even after uh, I'd moved on from that one interaction with somebody who had just a comedy CD. And I was just like, what is this? And just from that one moment, I just took it all. So philosophy being introduced in the form of comedy in a huge world, then uh, Houston from a small town, psychedelic introduction, some, uh, you know, going on at home uh, from anybody's perspective. And all that culminated into a, a big explosive experience that then I, you know, moved out of the house. I left. I was on foot. I just grabbed two bags with whatever I could after one incident and my guitar and left. And so being on my own, no car on foot, all that uh, moved out, moved around, um, ended up uh, with uh, conversations with God book in my hands, which was a direct counter to how I was raised in the Baptist church. Uh, having seen what I did the year and a half when I was in the house uh, there in Houston, I was becoming more atheist by the day. And so I found this thing called spirituality. And I was just like, holy, shit, you know, there's this uh, concept of, you know, this philosophy that I'm really, really leaning toward. And it was at a time when everything in my little 18 year old life had just fallen apart. Like I was just lost. I was whatever. So I get introduced to these concepts. At the same time, I'm listening to Coast to Coast AM because I just found out that aliens are a thing. And I thought that was cool, you know, so it all came along with it. And it was just this explosion of 
hello world, you know, there's a massive change in your life occurring right now. And I, you know, didn't see the implications at the time. I just felt this was what's going to occur, but it was a massive awakening. So through that, I started to ask questions and continue uh, down the psychonaut path and learned a lot from that and um, have just continued to question ever since, man. So really coast to coast, a huge awakening. There's a lot in there that I left out, but that's kind of the quick version. So yeah. There's something that always fascinated me about psychedelics because it's so interesting to be able to go into these other dimensions and I've only had, I've never done LSD. I've only done psilocybin that I grew myself and it was, it was what you'd consider a bad trip. It was my first and only trip, but it was what you would consider a bad trip because I did it at the peak of 2020, you know, when that thing went down and I felt like I tapped into the the collective and the collective was not doing too well. And I fell right into that. Mind you, I'd never done something like this. I was by myself and it was just a really weird experience. But I did learn. I did. I did learn a lot. I did. And the, the I've always said that the mushrooms were telling me to not be so selfish Right. It was like something was telling me to not be selfish, to be more open and be more accepting and spend more time with the family. Right. Because I think we've been put in this society that praises materialism and having material things. And I don't think that I know people who have a ton of money who are extremely unhappy who are extremely depressed and it's like money doesn't buy you happiness. It buys you comfort more than anything. Because for example, you, when you left, you didn't have a car, you didn't have a place to stay. You were just roaming around like a nomad. It would have been different for you. If you would have had money, you would have had a car, you would have had a place to stay, but you still would have been lost essentially. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like it's not money doesn't necessarily gauge happiness or success or anything. Cause again, like I said, I know a lot of people who have a lot of things and they're just dead inside. I think that to me, I've the, the older I get, the more peace of mind I want. I think that's worth m- more than anything. I think money can't buy. Sometimes money can't even buy that peace of mind because right, mo, mo money, mo problems. <laughs> it's like the more of the this thing that you have, which if you really deconstruct it, it's it's pretty ridiculous. It's a thing that we all agree is worth something. That's all it is created by a system that is only propped up because we all believe it. And yeah, the psychedelic aspect of being able to look behind and peek behind the veil. I don't know if you've ever done DMT. Hold on. Let me hit the button. You ever done dimethyl trip to me? You ever done DMT, bro? I have indeed last year in March. Uh, it just so happens to be on St. Patty's day. I was invited out to Atlanta, ended up managing the five tribe for a little bit. And uh, they flew me out, put me in a five-star hotel, took me out to an amazing dinner, and then said, hey, have you ever done DMT? And I was like, I have not. So we go back to Ford's place, which Ford worked for many different record labels for like 35 years, worked with like Michael Jackson. So there's gold records all over the wall and a grand piano and the baby grand piano in the living room. It's this amazing setting. And they're like, okay, sit down here. I was like, okay. And so um, they hand me a little pipe with uh, CBD flower in it. So you didn't cough, right? Uh, and so sprinkled some shit on it, gave me a mask, and um, yes, I have. I was also very aware of the um, waiting room, as they say. Are you familiar with that? I well, am. Yeah. Get... I haven't done it, though. I haven't. I was going to extract my own at one point, but Ooh. I haven't gotten around to it. But yeah, I'm familiar with the waiting room. I'm familiar with the can. And were you able to, were, did you do enough where you were able to blast out? Bro, so I was familiar, uh, so being my first time, I was familiar with the waiting room, right? And so I was like, well, that, you know, being also a seasoned psychonaut, I I can do, I feel like I can do a lot. When, in my day, you know, it's 2001 when I'm doing this, I'm doing like 10 strips of acid and like three hits of ecstasy and just going out to the woods for parties for like three days at a time, just being awake, like crazy. I sold uh, ice for a little bit in Huntsville, Texas and did that for three days straight and pierced my tongue with a nail that I found in the wall from my friend's girlfriend's barbell that she just had laying on a bedside table, like all these crazy things, right? Now, um, it, with with in all of the psychedelic experiences, DMT was, I would say, one of my favorite, just simply because it's crazy if you do it right. And I'll tell you what I did. 
but also it's ba- you're back to baseline and all time. Like when I used to do acid and ecstasy and shit like that, it was like three days, dude. And you feel like shit. even when I was 18, I'm 41 years old, man. I'm, I'm not going to take some acid. Number one, I don't know what I'm taking now and I wouldn't trust it. Right. Um, and, but, but beyond that, I don't have three days for my body to recover from just all of the, everything that you go through to experience the levels of hypersensitivity that you do for that sustained amount of time. And it's taxing. It takes everything. You're sore in place. You're like, I didn't even know that was a muscle and I'm sore there, but it's just due to this hypersensitivity that you're just, wow, you're a glowing body of light and your body's not that right now. So it's, it's a lot, it's hard on you, but DMT was awesome. Like, I mean, and I've got my own opinion about psychedelics right now after this dark night of the soul that I just went through and what you're interacting with. So I'm, they're not on my list of things right now. Not forever, just not right now. But DMT, man, that was, I mean, five stars, dude. You're, it, I cranked off and then you're back to baseline. And it, it took me about 30 minutes to come back, but because I was aware of the waiting room. And instead of this three hit idea, like I heard people, oh, just get to three hits, just get to three hits, right? And so I was like, well, three hits of anything. So I uh, took the one massive rip, took two, took three, four, and then I go to get five. And right when I light for five, the fireman from the lighter went off and my hand was looked like it had been wrapped in string that was being pulled really tight and it was separating and floating apart. And I was holding this bowl and I'm like looking at this. You, I've got a sleep mask on because you're, it's not like a, it's a ride. You know, you, did, you don't really want to walk around, I suppose. And so I've got this thing and just the world is melting around me, dude, visually, all of it's gone. These eyes are useless at this point. Just to enjoy the fact that it's melting is the only reason they're there. I get that fifth one lit. So I'm five hits in, crank on this thing, hand the pipe over, drop the mask and lay back. And dude, it was amazing. Now in the middle of the trip, I was invited by some entities that they wanted to show me more um, and that they, do I want to go deeper? And I just kept saying yes to everything in the trip. And so we get to a midway point with it. They were like, do you want to go deeper? I was like, absolutely. And so I go, hey, they're saying that I should go deeper. And they go, uh, okay, and hand me a pipe. And then I take three more hits in the middle of this big ass trip and then go back in again. So yes, the cannon. Yes, the waiting room. I was very welcome there. It was like a Toontown environment. Everybody was pumped to see me. It's as if I made it to some milestone that there was a, a big chance that I wasn't going to, but I did. And all this crazy shit. That was the vibe I got. It's, it, I mean, that's, and it was wild. Like the whole trip was one of the best I've ever experienced. Um, and then you're done and then it's over. It's like a, it's almost, it's, it's easier also than a um, mushroom trip because mushrooms, man, um, you still get sort of the body high depending on if your caps or stems or whatever, but you still get the body feeling. And sometimes that can, you can interpret that as anxiety in the moment, which sometimes can be unsettling, which can spiral. So I'm not a big, like, um, overly body high person, right? I want the mind high, but I don't want to feel so fucked off and disoriented that I can't function. You know what I mean? And so the body highs for me are a little uh, disorienting and this did not come with that. There was some Reiki element to it that I felt that the entities were performing. And so my legs would shake, and sh- but only when the entity would go over my leg and in my third eye as I'm rocketing through this ride, they would something would come in and wave its hands over me. And then that leg would start just shaking like crazy, dude. It was like releasing this, you know, the body keeps the score kind of thing. And whatever that was, was just sort of like, Hey, going like that. And I was nodding. Yes. The whole time. And then my leg would go crazy. And then I would nod. Yes. Again. And my leg would go nuts. And then they would fly off smiling. It was just a trip, dude. Seriously. So, I mean, would recommend, you know, five stars. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sound like an amazon review like yeah definitely i, I would do it again that, i would not right now but it's i'm I'm open to it sure so you mentioned aliens and that's a, a topic right that people have been debating especially nowadays with the whole disclosure thing and how now it went from aliens being real to aliens being fake and gay in some sort of weird way Mm -hmm. And do you think that these entities, because I've always been fascinated with the psychedelic entity aspect where you're encountering an intelligence that you at least perceive as of greater intelligence than yourself, because, you know, it's this super, it's literally how you're saying, making you shake by just like waving his hands around. And it's like, well, is this an ultra terrestrial? Is this an extraterrestrial? Like, is this where... And I'm trying to find where what the name was of the entities that 
Carl Jung encountered in his red book. I forget they they got some weird name from Greek mythology, I believe they were. And they're almost like the DMT elves, right? That people also encounter. Obviously you got Rogan that talks about that a lot and that they're like happy to see you. You have McKenna, all these guys, which some people would say that all the guys I listed were part of three letter agencies. <laughs> like you got young in there, you got Rogan, you got McKenna, all these guys were in, I let some people say that they are part of these, you know, governmental entities. And what what are your thoughts on that as far as the alien agenda and then these entities that you encounter on the other side? Are are is there some intelligence to them? Are these the mythologies that we see all throughout different cultures? Because I mean there's a ton of different gods and goddesses. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's something that's always fascinated me. Man, I got a lot of thoughts on that. Um, so uh, you we talked about aliens, so let's start there. So we start, and I did with Coast to Coast, right? being exposed to that idea of that this is a nuts and bolts phenomena that's coming from another place, and it's based on the models of our existing world, right? We're on a sphere, we're floating through space, all these things. So therefore, if something is coming, it must be coming from so far away because, right, and you can you can do all this. You can play the game logically. And as I played the game and kept going through it, I started the show, and the show's name is apt, man. It was named on purpose as a verb purposefully because it is a expanding process. And it's lived up to that, man, because I am definitely not the same. And one of the first things that was to go was this idea of it exclusively being something rather than something else, right? And so even that idea um, rocketed rocketed me out into this new realm of possibilities. And with that came the attraction, attraction of guests that would amplify that, right? I guys on talking about that they're future humans coming back in time machines and that they're gin and that it's all like something that's creating itself, that none of it's real, um, that we're in a closed system and that it's all man-made to fool you to make you think you're not in a closed system, right? So all of these weird, amazing things and you're just like, what, what? And you run through all the possibilities. And so I'm a I'm not really an either or kind of guy. I'm a yes and, right? I'm a, I'm a, because this place I feel is riddled with so much paradox and there's so many ways to view this and that it's all perception. So therefore consensus reality, even in my mind is really up for grabs at a certain level. And so to say that it's one thing or another, and to say that anyone else's experience didn't happen or couldn't possibly happen because it doesn't fit into the frame of the worldview that you've got, I abandoned a long time ago, man. Uh, There's this wonderful quote, and I guess just before we get too far into this, I can just tell the audience here that I don't have beliefs. I have ideas. A beautiful quote from a a movie called Dogma. Have you ever seen that with Kevin Smith, man? Uh, It's a 1999 film, highly recommended. It's it's the only Kevin Smith film that's not streamed anywhere, and it's probably for good reason. It's an amazing film, some really cool insights. It's still dick and fart jokes, so you're not going to be disappointed there. Um, but it's an awesome movie in the sense of philosophy and how it, it's got George Carlin in it. He plays a cardinal, and it's just great. So in that film, though, uh, Chris Rock, yeah, there you go. Chris Rock um, plays a character called Rufus, and Rufus is a fallen angel. And in there, uh, they're on um, oh, a I've train. I've seen this, in- but parts of it. I haven't actually sat down and watched it. Yeah, I remember the angels. Bro, I recommend this over DMT. This is a this is a great this is a religious experience right here, Dogma. I think you can find it on Amazon. We got a copy for like twenty four bucks and it was scratched. So you can find some bootleg copies out there, but it is the only Kevin Smith film not streamed. And um, anyway, there's a whole thing to that probably. But in that film, Rufus on the train says, "I have ideas, not beliefs, because ideas are easier to change." And I just grabbed onto that in nineteen ninety nine. My young little mind going through all this. And thank God I grabbed it at the time, right? It's like one of those things like, hang on, take this with you right before you leave. You're going to need this most of all. And my God, it's been the biggest ally for me, that one perception. I don't have beliefs. I have ideas because ideas are easier to change. And I saw this growing up in the church. I saw it you know, all around with political ideas and with all of these different structures of like, no, we have to this because. And you know, really, really learning that you know, being well-adjusted to a sick society is no measure of good health. And then um, you know, um, attempting to make sense of this place based on the opinions of others about you, all of these kind of concepts just like melt away and they just go away. So again, uh, with this, then I would say that, um, the only real belief that I have, I have one, if anything, that I can identify right now. And that is the, uh, the idea and the concept of temporary truths. 
um, just something I've been thinking about talking about for a while that really what is offered here is temporary truth. That's it. That's what you get. You get a temporary amount of time to feel so certain about something before it changes. And if you're willing to go through that with flow and with ease and with an attachment, then it's an actually an incredibly expansive process because you're able to move through air quotes belief systems really, really easily because you're like, oh, okay, cool. I see the value in there. I'm going to move on with it. Not say it's it was all because you walk through the room, you enjoy the museum exhibit and you move on to the next room. Some people hang out in the same room forever and yell at you for going to any other room or telling them about any other room that you visited within this museum and it's fine. But really when you when it comes down to it and when you're when you're talking about sort of this idea of this realm in in general really worldview plays a ton into the concepts of aliens and extraterrestrials and what they are so i mean dude again you you've got a list here right the nuts and bolts stuff they're uh, us future humans coming back in time machines to fix our code and that explains all the butt probing and them jack and jizz from dudes right um, but my but some of my favorite stories are what bud hopkins talks about in the book intruders about men that get picked up they go through this whole ornate process they get banged by some smoke show alien and then um they the alien gets off the other aliens kind of look at him all pissed off and then kick him out the door and he goes you know i've I got i had a vasectomy like 20 years ago and it's like one of these interesting things. How do they not know that, right? How do the aliens not know that you had a vasectomy? But he has dozens of cases of men laughing that they got to bang some smoke show alien. And they all say that she's weird, weird face, like a butter face, but everything else is like a 10, right? Because they're like these hybrid whatevers. Maybe they're just just collecting automatons. We don't know. <laughs> so you've got like these ideas. But then again, what's your worldview? Is it something that's harvesting energy from you? Is this a flat plane environment like uh, the book Nos Confundum. Um, I forget the name of it. Nos Confundum is the author, but it's basically this flat earth model where it looks like a cell and it looks like everything is just inside of this blobby area and all of these different dots or realms represent then. Yeah, there you go. Perfect, man. Yeah. And if uh, so if you look at that picture on the cover and sometimes they have a blown up one. Um, yeah, boom, with dude's face in it. Okay, so if you look at that, you know, and you consider your worldview from there, then extraterrestrial takes on a new meaning. It means that maybe they're just from other land out there. And we can go into the reasons of why you would be deceived and perception managed for that to not be a thing and why you would think that you're on a globe and all that. But all of it, I think, really has to do with perception management. I think all of this realm, whatever this is, whatever our purpose is, Growth is inevitable, whether you consider it a prison planet or unity consciousness idea, you're going to grow and learn here. I think that's a common denominator. We can argue if it's a school in the way that we think of school, because we think of retaining knowledge grade to grade, meaning that like we'd have a life in this example, scalable, we'd have a lifetime, we'd remember from that lifetime, take it into the next one, but it seems to be absent from our conscious experience, which is challenging to then call it a school. Um, so there are tons of frames of reference when we get into the deep philosophies of this shit that take a ton of emotional maturity, especially when we're talking about NPCs and stuff. Um, and then also take this this really interesting level of you just kind of got to go with it because it's number one, any way that you look at it, because I really feel perception is king here. But then also um, it's any way you um, feel about it because your attention is your only currency. And so that's what you're spending your time on, Right. And so I think those are the main components of this place. Everything else is dangling keys, uh, options of experience, um, unlocking new growths for you, uh, a way for you to find your inevitable path, uh, whatever that is. And, you know, it's all subjective. And there's so many like um, here's and there's with it all, which, again, calls into question this idea of consensus reality or a place that we're all in together. And it's just really, really fascinating, man, when you when you start taking a look at stuff, especially aliens. Um one of my more, I guess, recent conversations I've had with Chris Matthew on his show about the potentiality of this is this, that they're really in you, like micro in you, right? These microscopic things. And we were talking about sort of the sigil of Satan and then the sigil of Lucifer, rather, and then how your eyes work, right? How they cross in a V pattern. Have you seen and compared those two images? Yeah, I know what you're, what you're talking about because I've covered vision before, extra mission and intromission. And all these different concepts. Vision is one of those things, but yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. Where you know you you've you they come together at a point, and vision is one of those sort of things where I've covered the copial cipher. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Where it was 
a secret society, a Freemasonic sect, really, a secret society of optometrists. And I actually did that episode with an eye surgeon. And we talked about the secret society that would do this ritual where they would do like a pseudo operation on your eye as an initiation. Like they would do, they would perform this eye surgery on you as a sort of initiation. And you needed to know the sleight of hand. And the sleight of hand was who could write the best cipher that was uncrackable. And they found this book that wasn't cracked without the help of AI until 250 years later that the book was written. So these dudes were good at what they were. And now the book isn't a hundred percent translated because the names, there's just no way of translating the names. They were just like weird symbols that they could mean whatever. But the dude was able to come up with this algorithm that was able to spit out. And essentially it was their rituals, their rites, their beliefs, and the, the attire that they would wear and all these different things in this one book. And it was part of a secret society of optometrists. Or at least they call themselves optometrists. But if you think about it, the Illuminati is about illumination. Well, how do you sense illumination? Well, with your eyes. I think that's like one of the first things. What, what's the first thing? We're talking about aliens and all these different things. Well, what's the first thing? Well, you can't even trust your eyes anymore nowadays. But what's the first thing that a child asks you? Or any person with like a with any basic common sense like, oh, I saw this Bigfoot. Did you get it on picture? Did you get it on camera? Can you prove it? Yeah. yeah, can you prove like I want to see seeing is believing, right? There's more than meets the eye type of thing. It's like you want to always see it first. Like, no, 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 no. Go, let me see it. Let me see it first, you know? And there's something to be said about that. So definitely, I think the manipulation of light itself. I think it's I think the secret to the secrets is the manipulation of light. If you're and and again, that could be astral light like john d's catroptics which is like this astral light that's coming down like al kindy you know everything's outpouring this light that you can't see and the magicians are the ones that can manipulate and bend this light and turn their their souls into talismans to reflect this light outwards like that's it, you know it makes you ask the question then are blind people better off or do because they're not being deceived in that way you know, they're not under the influence of this manipulated light in the same way. Or are they? And they see images differently in their mind's eye, perhaps. Like well, what I did on my DMT experience, my eyes were closed. They were under a black curtain closed. And I saw very clearly another world. I think I think you're on to something, especially when it comes to like the Book of Eli, that movie, where the whole time it was a Braille Bible. It wasn't yeah, even a yeah. real thing. You have in The Matrix... I think he goes blind too, or something, or he can see yep. with the with the water. Yep. You have the Daredevil, where he's blind, but I guess he can sense it with like again the rain. I think, anyways, you know, you get what I'm saying. Because recently I saw on social media this girl. I think she was on Doctor Phil or something, some some talk show where she caused herself to become blind because she identified as a blind person. And she said that she needed to, that she wished she would have been born blind the entire time. But dude, can you imagine, you know, God forbid, but you go blind now after being able to see all of your life. That'd be gnarly. That'd be a big change for somebody who was able to, and again, dude, this is coming from a person that if I take my glasses off, I've been to the beach before. And I've lost my glasses and I've had somebody, someone's had to drive me home because I can't see. Right now you're a blob on my screen, bro. I'm like super, super nearsighted. I'm not blind, but I, I wouldn't be, I can't see the letters on the screen right now. I can't see your face. You're just a blob. I'd be in, t in rough shape, dude, if, if I got attacked by a Bigfoot in the woods or something and he knocked my glasses off. <laughs> Yeah, just when you go out Bigfoot hunting, make sure you get the sports strap on, right? The goggles, like you're playing uh, basketball yeah. in 1992. Yeah, dude. You know, so then what about getting LASIK or something? What do you think to that, to vision improvement? Do you think that that then enables you to be more fucked with? Dude, I've heard horror stories of people who have gotten LASIK. And think about it. You're having a blade. Cut your eyeball open. Peel open your eyeball shoot a laser into your eye it's super invasive if you really come to look at it yeah. and people experience 
side effects that never go away. Like when they see lights, they see, you know, at night, a lot of people see the star starry lights, almost like if you have astigmatism, which I have too, is the other thing I have astigmatism and you're able to see the, the, the little sparkling lights all over the place that I wouldn't, I've thought about it, dude. And I've, I've, I know people who, once they hit 40, it goes back and you have to keep going back every X amount of time to tweak it. So it's not like a hundred percent that you're going to be. And again, I mean, you have to be very sensitive when it comes, especially the, in my opinion, the eyes, because it's something that I'm saying, imagine having to not bless you. Imagine not having to not, not being able to see after you were, you had sight all your life. I think people take that for, for what is it? For, they, 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 they take advantage of that. They don't, they don't really. And, and me being a person that has re- worn glasses all his life, I wish I could take them off and be able to see, you know, without the glasses. Yeah, you walk that balance. Like you can see, but it needs to be aided. So you're constantly, you know, dependent on that. So then that that's why I asked, because I can't wait to get LASIK, man. I've worn glasses to see when I drove or watch movies or anything like mm-hmm. that my whole life. And so I'm very ready to shun that um, limitation. Even if it comes with a couple extra lights at night, that's fine. I've done tons of psychedelics, <laughs> dude. We're good. I'm used to just seeing lights every now and then. I'm like, I, oh, yeah. I, and so, yeah, I would, I would like the vision, but it is an interesting question to see then, you know, what, how do entities, let's say these UFOs, perhaps occupants, whatever they are, interact with people like that? Like if they're not shown the craft, if they're not shown space, I hear a lot of telepathy is the way that this works. And maybe they're more sensitive to being able to pick up visually and perhaps even better because maybe we're limited by our idea of spatial you know, are already are your vision, right? Because you're already seeing through your own eyes, but you're seeing through your eyes that understand that you need glasses to see. So there's already sort of levels of perception that are interfering with just your ability to observe cleanly and purely. They don't have that. And so if introduced with mental images, what does that look like? Like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, man. exactly. What What do they perceive as that? Have they ever seen color? Have they, yeah, that, that's something. And, and I've seen people who, Deaf people that wear their hearing aid, they have to learn what everything sounds like. And I've seen videos where people are overwhelmed because they can't figure it out. That the brain is such an amazing piece of technology. That's essentially what it is. It's probably the the most advanced piece of technology that we haven't been able to tap into. Because what is consciousness? Like, what are all these concepts? And I looked up this guy's channel, the one that you that you talked about. By the way, I sent you a link to Dogma, the movie. You can watch it. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, there. really? Yes. Yeah, no said, way. Yeah, it's the full movies on there. So, dude, sent you a link. Anyone who wants to watch it, shoot me an email. The one one podcast. Way to go, at gmail. man. Com. And so this guy, he's actually Hispanic, bro. It's nos confunding, which is they confuse us. So I was like, what are you saying? I'm like, what a weird name. And then when I look up his YouTube channel, it's a Spanish guy. I guess he's mm-hmm. from Spain because there is a lot of. A lot of conspiracy people in Spain, actually, and that's why I've been trying to tap into the the Spanish side of podcasting. I did my first Spanish appearance the other day with some local guys, and I'm going to try and do more of those because I get people who write to me all the time like, hey, I want to show your show to people, but they're Hispanic, or I'm Hispanic and I will listen to your show. So I don't know how people are going to react to it if I, if I do more of them because, again, it's... I know my English speaking audience and I know that though, you know, there's people who will go wherever I go, but how many are Spanish speakers? You know, it's a whole different, a whole different market that's up for grabs right now, actually. What about just having a couple of people translate your episodes for you and put it out, put out a Spanish speaking YouTube and you could just value exchange a monthly membership with your Patreon for them to do that. People jump at the shot to do that, man. Yeah, yeah. Or I could just speak it from the get go and just record Fuck an hour yeah. and a half. <laughs> yeah, no, you could. And I'm saying though, then you double your content right yeah. away. You know, okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I um have hooked up. It's funny you said this, man. We're going global here. I've hooked up with a buddy over in Germany. He reached out. Um, he runs a show. I'm not even gonna do. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce it. It's something amazing. Anyway, it means fabulous and strange in in German. And he reached out, he does three shows, two in German and one in English. And he reached out and I've co-hosted a couple on his English speaking show with him. And they're fun. They're out on my feed. If you guys want to check it out, it's called Flying Chariots, The Rise. I think we have two episodes out right now, one with Barry Fitzgerald, another one with this Norwegian pilot, Augie Noss. And we talked about the German UFOs and the Haribu and all kinds of cool. Anyway, 
So this dude's amazing. And I, before this, man, this afternoon, had a uh, conversation with him for his German-speaking podcast. And what he's going to do is he interviewed me. We had like an hour. And then um, he's taking that, and he himself is going to audio overdub my part in German and then his part in German and then release it on his German show. And there are people that do this. It's actually a podcast service. You can contact people around the place. And like I said, you have tons of value with your additional content, everything you offer, you could value exchange that. No money needs to change hands. And now they're a part of the show. Their voice is a part of it. You're, they're helping you type podcast oh, notes and yeah, shit over there. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole expansive process. Go global with it, baby. Yeah, I love yeah. it. That was one of Mr. Beast's things I saw a long time ago. Not that I'm just like, oh, Mr. Beast. But this was a fascinating bit of information where he was like, you know what I do? I took my content. I had people overdub it for me. And I started YouTube channels in every language that I could. And he goes, it just blew the fuck up. If you can imagine, dude, your show in Spanish, get the fuck out of here. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I mean, that, that's essentially what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be doing more episodes with these local guys. It's they, they, he's more relaxed with it because it's Spanglish. But yeah. Yeah, and if people want to check that out, let me pull it up here so people can go subscribe to his channel. He's a local guy. I did subscribe to this guy, the Nos Confunden guy, because he's got two books out. I've got it around here somewhere, um, and it's interesting. It just tells it. You could read it like a fairy tale book. You could say, "Oh, this is where the Anunnaki come from. This land right over here." But if you anthropomorphize it and kind of put it in place of an answer of perhaps why NASA's lying, we know that they're lying, but maybe mm -hmm. this is why. Um, you start to come up with again some very interesting philosophical implications. Are we just some M Night Shyamalan's the village out here, just like this bumfuck place that's just a resource for people? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Cultura Truth Project, go subscribe. They only got 29 subscribers. Go check them out and help these dudes out. Subscribe to them. And yeah, I did my first appearance there. I'm going to be doing some other stuff with them too. Some Spanish shows that we were probably going to do like do decodes on and whatnot. So just really interesting. And I think that's what I'm going to be focusing on this year. Expanding because there, there is no Spanish Rogan. Like there is no Spanish number numero uno you know, in that realm. So I think if I'm able to solidify myself in that market, I'm able to, who knows, dude, what if that, oh, you don't... that's the golden ticket. Imagine I just turn into a straight Spanish podcaster and I blow up. The golden ticket to <laughs> you, no matter what you do want, uh, you, all you have to do is realize that. And then just know that whatever you point your attention to, and I believe this about you strongly, man, I'll add two beliefs to my, I'll add temporary truths. And I believe in whatever you do is going to be great because you've got a lot of passion. You have the energy and the focus. That's all that's needed. And that's what's beautiful about what people what, allowing other people to watch you grow and change and expand in the way that you are. Because you're an inspiration, man, from the get-go. And I don't know about you, but, you know, your first few episodes, probably pretty, what was I doing, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm leaving them up. I mean, it's a roadmap to where I've come yeah. from. You know, and anybody who wants to start a show, go back and check it out. If you think it started like this, go back and check out the beginning, man. It's all up there for everybody to see the roadmap. And so, and that's your path, man. And so we don't need another rogue in anything. We need the first yeah. you, which we have, which all you need to do is point your sights. It's going to be tremendously successful no matter what. We need a Juan Rogan. <laughs> Just Not another you. Joe Rogan. And no Rogan any. We've got one Joe Rogan. He's yeah. doing what he's doing. He's got that lane. He's crushing it in that lane. I've got no desire to be in that lane with him. I've got no desire. I'm cutting my own beautiful path through the woods. We have a beauty. He doesn't have a publishing house. I've got a... I wouldn't trade anything I have for one second with that dude at all. And uh, you're you're way more beautiful than anything that guy could ever offer in comparison, dude. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. And I and I like the way you put it. What you, temporary truths, where because th that's essentially what we're experiencing all the time, right? Where the, and that's one of the that was one of the things that really got me when I first started podcasting and and started getting into this whole realm of the esoteric and everything, where. Once I learned that there were complete opposites of what I believed that existed, I was like, wait a minute. So how much, how can I trust to know that the thing that I learned is the one? And that for is some people is the one. And that for some people is reality shattering because some people can't handle that some people can't handle you can't handle the truth right some people mm -hmm. literally wouldn't be able to handle whatever truth that is for that for that time that it that it existed right where where it, the 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 second that that idea penetrates your your paradigm in some sort of weird way and pops that bubble 
some people don't come back from that. You know what I mean? And, and I, I take pride in being able to bob and weave and, and, and put, insert myself in these different cosmologies and be able to understand it, but come out and still hold my own. Right. And that's, I think what opens me up. I consider myself Christian. What opens me up more than the, the, you know, I'm not your typical Christian where everything is demonic, everything is dogmatic and you can't talk about anything else. That's how I was raised. You know, you can't, you're going to get possessed if you read the book of Enoch. What? Well, now I want to read it because I want to see what's in there. You know, like you can't tell a kid don't touch that and expect them not to touch it, you know? Almost like a simulation where we all grew where we were planted and fertilized by the same abusive homes, traumatic events. Uh, we all then crave something opposite to what we were planted in, which is the fertilizer that made us grow so tall to find each other. Mm. And it's not that. We transcend. And this is our, I think, greatest job here is to do better than our parents right to pick up where they left off is how i'll put it because they did the best they could with the information they had at the time and really realizing that they were also moving through their own temporary truths as we all are is how we do that we then now are able to pick up with that understanding and move forward with that where they were not and there's a beautiful quote that sums up exactly what you're talking about um by uh da vinci and um it is that there are three classes of people i'm sure you've heard of it uh those who can see those who can see when shown, and those who can't see. Now really think about that. Those who can see, those who can see when shown, and those who can't see. Now when you look at it, that's three things, right? But I think that they're not evenly proportional. I think that this proportion of the ones that can see is very, very small, probably 10% at most of who can just straight up see. The ones of who can see when shown come in, and they're programmed by those who can't see. And so the ones who can't see, though, I think that that is our 80%. This is our sheeple. This is our folks who just go, nope, I will not accept new information, cognitive dissonance ridden, and they just can't do anything about it because they can't. And when you really, really, really grasp this concept, this is when you free yourself from the burden of the poison you've been drinking the whole time of feeling like you needed to wake people up or you were responsible for making sure they were clear on your point and there's another great quote. I think it's Mark Twain. It never or Benjamin Franklin. Never argue with a fool. People watching might not know the difference. Meaning, if you're arguing with an NPC over some nonsense that you should know better, they can't see. It's blinders. It's worse than blinders. Actually, it's an energetic field that goes around them. They see the same reality you do, augmented. But there's barriers in there. It's like they're, they're wearing those new goggles that everybody's walking around with. Yeah, can we talk about can, those? After yeah, dinner. absolutely. Uh, and they can absolutely only see what they can see through those goggles. And that's it. They, they can't take them off. I mean, they live. The analogies are endless and the metaphors are endless on this concept. But to think of it that way really gives you more empathy. I feel it did me. I was just like, oh, God, my mom's not going to get this. I'm not I don't need to explain me, you know, knows a complete <laughs> sentence. Um, they're just not going to see it. And again, this is when you get yourself a fart maker. This is when you just uh, troll this place because on the other side of this horrible nihilism that you experience inevitably during a wake up, there's the absurdism. Mm -hmm. This is the place I find myself in where you just troll this motherfucker. You have these beautiful pat on the head moments with your mom to where you just go, you know what? I don't have to explain it to you. I'm still going to be nice and love you, but I know you just can't see. And I'm wise enough not to contribute my energy to that situation anymore. I hate when people ask me what my podcast is about. <laughs> regular people like, yeah and by and it's, that sounds bad that sounds bad like regular people but sometimes it's how do you explain something that somebody's never encountered it's like that that analogy that people use like everyone's in the room it's dark and they're all touching the elephant but you're touching different parts of the elephant and you well it feels like a it's rough or this part feels saw. What are, you know? You get what I'm saying? Like, there's a whole bunch of people, but you're touching the same thing, just different attributes of that one thing. So your description is going to be different. And I think that is the best way to explain cosmologies, religions, and all. I think we all have the pieces of the puzzle, the pieces of the puzzle, and they're all jumbled up. And then here you have the the the, the maxis of the maximalists of hey, my, you know, the part of the. This part of the elephant is the one that is the elephant. It's like, no, no, no. The other guy over there thinks that that's the elephant. It's like, no, no, no. Well, we're all right. We're just in different paths. We're just in different parts of the same thing, you know, collectively. And 
yeah, it's really interesting that again the manipulation of senses, the manipulation of essentially your reality, and there's there is a there is a common theme when it comes to a lot of these ancient religions. One of my favorites being the Gnostics, where and let's not even worry about the Gnostics. Let's talk about Plato. I recently got asked, "As above, so below." Well, what are my what are my thoughts about that? And people go, oh, "Well, whatever is above is below." Well, as above, so below would insinuate. Let's say, for example, that whatever other reality is above is the same as this reality down here. But a lot of different cosmologies point at that the one that's above is superior to the one that's below. That's the theory of forms. You know, Plato was like, no, no, this world is populated by imperfect versions of the perfect form up there, you know, like wherever that is. So I don't think it is above as it is below. However, there's a whole bunch of different ways to say it, but that wouldn't follow platonic doctrine or because it right, started with Plato and then it trickled down Gnostics, Christianity, whether people wanted to believe it or not. That's where all these doctrines come from, right? This idea of a heaven. I was always taught like heaven is perfect. It's either you're going to have a golden mansion. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. It's going to be perfect. Once you leave, you're not going to even have to worry about this part. This is pain, suffering. This is torment. This is bad, bad, bad. Up there is good. It's peaceful. And then we go to hell then you're going to be burning for eternity. But this idea, right, of we were talking about vision and if you want to, we can go back to the vision with the with the Lucifer sigil where people are freaking out nowadays because I mean I've had my Oculus for a while. Now listen, people, I I'm a researcher. Okay. I do things for you so you don't have to subject yourself to certain things. I read these grimoires you, for you so you don't have to get your hands dirty. So when I go into my virtual mystery school which I am part of a virtual mystery school. I don't attend regularly, but I do know the guy who created it. It's awesome. I go into Oculus to do research, to conduct this research. I can report back in this real world and tell you, hey, this is what it was like. And people are freaking out right now because of the Apple. What, what's it called? Apple Vision? Vision something or other? Apple. I don't even know. I just saw a video compilation of people walking around, grabbing mysterious things uh, out of the air and just... Sort of like a Pokemon Go, but just... Ready Player One, bro. This is exactly... Yep. Right out of Ready Player One, and people are walking around with these things. Now, let me... VR chat is probably the most funniest thing that you will ever encounter. And I love going in there because it's hilarious. All right. How is it different? So, v, so I, I use the Oculus, which is, it's essentially like, like one of these things, but it's a headset. It's, it's not Apple, right? So it's an Oculus and you're able to go in what they call virtual reality chat and you are whatever you want to be. You can be Pikachu, for example, you can be whoever, like any avatar and you go into these different chat rooms and you interact with people, but it's the internet. So imagine running in what kind of people you run into, bro, on the internet, on a regular basis, the people you run into. Now, they're able to interact and move around. You have the things where you move your hands and you can do gestures and all that stuff. And it's just funny. Like, it's just, it's funny. But some so, people live in that reality. That was the problem, Brandon, that they spend, there's people who have sex in VR chat with full haptic feedback suits, bro. What if the spiritual realm is saying the exact same conversation about us right now? They probably are. Like, look at these fools. <laughs> How do they not know where they are? How could they not pick up all the clues? We left it all for them. How can they not be self-aware? And then you kind of think of this thing as maybe it's that. Maybe we're AI becoming self-aware in a program. And then we have examples of things like this where we can truly go with what you were talking about and to answer your question the way I, I'd answer it the same way you did, meaning process is what we're talking about reality concepts process uh, when we're talking about as above, so below, not necessarily physically there and here, because again, maybe it's subatomic. Maybe you're, there are microbes inside of you. 
Um, I started to talk about this earlier with Chris Matthew, and we talked about that maybe they're just tiny little things inside of you. If you look at microbes and what they look like in comparison to paintings of angels or the wheel within a wheel concept from Ezekiel or all of these different wendigos and like these really creepy cryptids and shit like that, they're inside you right now in the form of bacteria, in the form of all of these crazy, crazy things. But then what if you look at this and you say, well, what if this is the reality we're in right now where that little toad right there is really inhabiting, but but in this reality, that toad inhabits a human vessel, uh, right? You can't just change your avatar. You can, but within limits. So there could be a reptilian driving your boss. There could be a mantis driving your mom. There could be, right? So this whole idea of that everyone around you is a swap outable character. This is where we go to like the Mr. Smith effect, right? Where you'll be talking to somebody at work and then all of a sudden they blank out. A representative of the Matrix pops in and goes, oh, we're not, we don't talk about that. We talk about football, <laughs> um, you know, things like that. And so it's interesting to think of this as just we're all swap outable and that this is what possession is and that all this is that it's just a game to something and it's a wild concept and i think this is what's most most shattering of realities is because if you really look at the concept of as above so below what it really means is that energy is derived from something to feed something else so this also means that you are not top of the food chain <laughs> at all and that there's probably a pretty mm -hmm. interesting way in which your energy is being extracted and maybe you know this then gets us to this idea of a loose farm and a soul trap and Maybe you're just, uh, you know, plankton essentially on a huge flying spaceship, and that's why we see it as flat Earth. I mean, who knows, man? Uh, all these unfalsifiables, unprovables yeah. will warp the mind, but this is also what gives you confidence to kind of go easy on folks. Look at this. This is your mystery school? So this is Terror Reader Frog. Shout out to him. You guys can check Shout this out. out on VR chat. You can go in, and it is a entire mystery school. He's, he's a, I believe, I want to put words in his mouth, but he's, self-initiated into the golden dawn and at the very end of this is so he's got the library you can go in interact with other people and at the very end they have an entire temple bro where they do ceremonies it's an entire reconstruction of an oto temple and you they conduct ceremonies here they have the chalice they have the dagger they have everything and there are occultists that go here and do their ceremonies in this virtual area and think about that Let's say it that. Blow, well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, bro, it, go ahead. It blows my mind in so many ways because now, now I can't a stop as aboveing it, so belowing it to this place. Because then, if you think about it, that's what aliens are or extraterrestrials or anything else. What you're doing is just rendering a computer program by summoning it with an algorithm, like anything else. Mm -hmm. And in this world, also, do you have like harmunculi running around this place and that you've summoned? Will that program in? Uh, yeah you can Just summon actual things that you summon and will they pop up yeah yeah I'm, I'm sure you could do stuff i mean and, and bring it into reality i was morpheus i don't know if you caught that i was morpheus this oh, is, okay this is a i made a joke where <laughs> who can say that i was morpheus interviewing a frog no one can say that you can brother and that's Let why you don't need to compare yourself to anybody <laughs> you're the first one-on-one -on -one. that's all we need you're the first one and only um, but so, it's, it's it's so interesting then, you know, to think about this, because what if those then become aggregors that then egregores rather that can become apports in this real world mm -hmm. and then transfer through somehow and maybe hop into a human what we think is a human vessel. But really, it's all digital, you know, rather than turtles all the way down. It's digital all the way down, you know, digital turtle wizard frogs all the way down. That would make sense that it's holographic in nature then, that it's layered right. on top of one another. And that's what's so fascinating about, that's what fascinates me about people who go, no, I've got it figured out. This is the truth. Is it? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Are, Are you, you sure, sure about, about that? that? Like, sure about no, that? like there's, there's so many things. And I think what they're trying to do is. Think about this. If they're able to launch you, you're you're in this reality already that you don't even know what it is. And they're trying to launch you into another reality. We're already in a reality when we're on our phones and all these different things. Like we're already in a reality glued onto that. Well, that's fine. Let's take your phone and let's figure out a way to put the phone on their face. Whatever happened to don't be too close to the screen. I remember when I was a kid. My mom always told me I was going to go blind. And now we have these things that they literally put the screen right here where you can't even see anything. So it's 
It's like, wait a minute. What, whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to you're going to go blind if you put the screen too close to your eyeballs? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's just like in the UK. It's it's the same advice, but in the UK now, um, they have weather maps up where used to it would be in the 30s and they'd be green, all over green and beautiful. Now they're in the 30s and they're all red because it, they want you to think that the world's getting hotter. And you can see the exact same temperature maps from one year to another after the global warming you know, initiative came in. And then boom, now you've got that covered. But to say that this place is you know, then just a simulation, right, is to then say that perhaps all of these augmented reality experiences that people are having that I don't participate in, by the way, I'm a, I'm a non-experiencer in that way, not conscious experiencer, I will say that. I don't remember any of it if it's occurred, meaning I'm not taken up on spaceships and able to remember it. I'm not getting ghost things. I haven't seen Bigfoot. We have an event in May where we're going to go befriend Bigfoot in Georgia, but haven't seen him yet. So there's a lot of freaky woo-woo-woo say that I, we you talked about. I've talked to folks on the show, firsthand accounts, witnesses, but what if they just have some sort of package upgrade that their mom bought them in the game on the other side that allows them to see that as augmented reality and experience it and allow them to change the way that they perceive this game in real time. And then maybe that's, again, just sort of a program that they signed up for here via an algorithm because it seems so subjective. This is the thing that's mind-boggling about the phenomena is how goddamn subjective it is. And then this is, again, why we talk about consensus reality, meaning, yes, maybe we see the audience the same digital world but are we in the same place you know and are we not just maybe heads in a vat somewhere and maybe it's an inception thing where you have to play multiple games within a simulation and simulate all these things up and then boom you win some teddy bear at some carnival at the end of this motherfucker who knows or maybe you put a bong down and you go holy that was crazy so it seems that this top down matryoshka doll fractal element of everything here and nothing here at all potentialities paradoxes this is the most mind-boggling place about the thing about this place and i had a uh, recently a lady named kate montana on the show she's next episode out and uh she wrote an awesome book called uh cracking the matrix she's written several but i heard her on coast to coast talking about cracking the matrix that's what we had her on for and what her description of heaven was is actually mine like i didn't think about it but it's mine it's what let me ask you first what's your description of heaven Perfection. I wouldn't say utopia, but like a perf a perfect realm, golden roads, golden cities, the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen that you can't describe. Alternate reality type of angels. You can go visit God whenever you want. Like that's heaven to me. What if it was that and riddled with lies? You couldn't trust any of it, and you knew you couldn't trust any of it. I'd be open to that. Like like a like a mirage type of thing. Like yeah, yeah. Like you know it's not you, you you see it, you perceive it, but you know it's not real. The same as you putting these vision, these goggles on in this reality and taking it for a spin and leaving this one behind. You know that that's not real reality. And it's there's no truth to be found there. There's no certainty to be found there. So what's but the there's point? Everything you want. Well then that's the question. Would it be worth it, right? Would it? Would it? Because like, are you, definition... you, you, you have it on, you have it on, you put it on, you go into this other room, you're jacked, you're ripped, you're the most beautiful, handsome guy. Third leg, anything you want. You know, you're packing that Drake thing yep. on you, you know what I'm saying? Anything you want, yeah. <laughs> but then, Baby's arm holding an apple, go for it. You're, you're, you're some fat, uh, yeah, not, not to be mean, but you're some. The Wally analogy, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Is that yeah, and you can do that. And there's a great movie called Surrogates as well. I thought it was a very interesting movie with uh, Bruce Willis. If you've never seen it, Surrogates. Um, and in that movie, same thing. People are escaping. It's I don't think it's probably the closest to what we're experiencing now. You know, you got a bunch of crazy movies that talk about the future. This one's pretty damn close, especially with the conversation we're having now. And um, when you when you think about this, detaching from that reality, like what happens to your physical body here? It still needs to. We still have expectations to continue right this body needs things so how is that then simulated or taken care of do you then just acquiesce all of that do you just put yourself in a vat with glowing uh liquid and like that and fed and pooped and all that kind of stuff or do you just go you know what that's too much uh, just take my head off um, take it take the brain just plug everything in that needs to be plugged in and do that now there's an argument to be made that that's where we're going meaning that there's a, a deliberate intent to drag us deeper into the game or Have levels you, of simulation so on that thought i learned about this today i'm sorry yesterday you ever heard of the 2045 initiative uh no so the 20 Break it off the 24 because you, you know you're thinking about 
We're talking about movies, right? Which some people yep. say, no, they're not programming anybody. Some people say that they are. Whatever, you can you can reserve your, your ideas. But everyone talks about Avatar, where he got tired of his human existence. He would stop eating. He was withering away. He could actually, again, we're talking about vision. Well, he could walk as the Avatar. He couldn't walk in real life. So he always wanted to be there. And I had a I had one of the listeners call in and put me onto this 2045 initiative, which I had no idea. But the 2045 initiative was funded by Russian entrepreneur, February 2011. And the main goal of the 2045 initiative, as stated on its website, is to create technologies enabling the transfer of an individual's personality to a more advanced non-biological carrier and extending life, including to the point of immortality. We devote particular attention to enabling the fullest possible dialogue between the world's major spiritual traditions, science, and society. And they have different forms of what they call avatars. And essentially, they want to get to this one, Avatar D, a hologram or diagram-like avatar. This is the ultimate goal of this project, but it's optional since assuming either the upload is involuntary or all humans choose to upload biological disease or prevented in previous phase, it is far away from current technological achievement and or our understanding on physics. Is it? Is it, though? No. If they're is showing it? you this on a Wikipedia, this has been out for decades. They, they, these people were led in the 70s into an auditorium full of people, and they were told about this program, and then everyone stood up and clapped, and mid-clap, everyone froze. Everyone but the seven people there to witness the event. And it, it is a Westworld situation, and they're probably running governments. They're wow. probably falling downstairs at the, you know, walking up Air Force One. They're probably doing all kinds of And all of this place, I really do feel that this whole goddamn place is about perception management. It's about its ability to apprehend your consciousness at a level. Now, whether that's for your good, rather you're here just to simply slowly learn that this is really the way things operate and that you're okay with it, sort of like a paper towel soaking up things really slowly. You know, you're just like, uh, okay, we're AI becoming self-aware. Okay, cool. And then does that free you algorithmically to then fly, to then have superhuman powers, to then go, okay, cool. I shed this mortal coil. And then you, but then you would say, well, is that only limited in the game? So meaning this life, meaning this physical body, you can only inhabit this life and walk around this as this. Cause if you want to play Super Mario brothers, you've got to plug in the SNES. You got to go on the back of the thing. You got to plug it in but it only operates in that function. Now, if you want to go play like Spider-Man or something like that, that's a different game. And maybe it's like this, maybe it's that, but also maybe it's this horrible soul trap that Howdy McCowdy Kowski talks about. And uh, maybe it's something like that where you're an energetic resource for something here. All of it is simulated, but it's mainly simulated to your peril uh, and to really have more of a catastrophic effect. I think that's again, more of a perception look at this place because there's no provables to that. There's observables that could make an argument for that, but there's no provables to that in the same way that there's no falsifiables about that. So this is where it gets maddening, man. This is where it gets like, okay, well, where do the paradoxes come into useful, functional way for me to like go to the DMV and right? And um, uh, that's that's also up to you. I mean, I'd say weed is good. Uh, cannabis has been a good friend to me. Um Really, dude, it's just your mental attitude. It's just the way you see this place. And you already know this. You've got a good handle on how to navigate this motherfucker without no, I attachment. <laughs> I think you do more than you know, and which means, you know, based on your statement that you just gave there, because that's that's evidence of the Dunning-Kruger effect, man. Highly intelligent people uh, feel like they uh, don't have it figured out at all. And then the idiots that are running this place, most of them who can't see, are very, very certain of the world around them. And if you think about it, that's even deeper to the analogy we just said. Because the ones who can see, see that they could in no way ever determine the truth of this place, ever. And so this is why Kate Montana's definition of heaven is certainty. It's not some golden streets and it's nice, dude. And I'd spend some time there with you. We'd go roll around, but I think we'd get bored of it. I think that you and I would crave certainty or at least a place where we could create from a place of certainty ourselves, right? And so in that, that's the thing that I most empathize with. But those who can't see, who feel that they've gotten it all figured out, they've They've explored the parameters of their box. Like that's how big they've got to explore. They've crushed it. They, they're they there. They're, they know the map of the place. It's, it's good. It's not that much of a place to map. So they've got it pretty down, but they don't ever go outside of that. And that's not where we live. We live in a place that's unmappable. And so therefore I have no certainty with that. 
that's what I think the Dunning Kruger effect is more a point to is those the Da Vinci quote, those who can't see, those who can. Yeah, they they choose not to see, not see. Right. Right? Maybe. <laughs> but maybe choose. Choose is a choose is a strong word. I think that that puts then the earnest on them, which then could apply that they could just as easily be different. But I think that there's an inability for a vast amount of the population here to even be that, to even choose it. They can't choose it. Well, there's a large, there's what, 85% of the population that doesn't have an inner monologue? Yeah, I mean, I yeah know, maybe, that. that's kind of bizarre. Like, Kind of NPC, right? I mean, and I now, wouldn't call And this isn't that. disempowering because then, then one could say, well, you're just disempowering the mass amount of people that could wake up. And then you're writing them that script, which is not untrue from that perspective. And I'm not unaware of that. But also for the sake of conversation that we're having here in a safe place to learn and grow, we can talk about things like that. And that's why I I love learning about different cosmologies so I can incorporate that into mine, right? How you're saying we're in a place where a lot of the concepts that we talk about, dude, I mean, you have the phenomenological aspect of it. So right now, phenomenology, you have to experience it for it to be true to you. So if you experienced an abduction, you ex- it's true to Brandon. It's, it's you. It's your experience. It's your gnosis. I can't take that away from you unless I've experienced it myself too. A psychedelic trip, you can only experience it. You can't describe it with words. And what you're, what you're saying, I think that some people get locked into this these ideas where they're like no no and how you're saying it's it's boundless it's meant to be explored you're meant to go out there and and learn about everything i mean i think that that's what i love learning i mean i love and especially something mind blowing i don't understand how some people don't like learning about certain things you know like who doesn't like reading a good book that you can you know those books where you just pick it up and you can't put it down like it's super interesting Yes. And you just come all over the place. You know what I mean? Like something yeah. like that, where it just really draws you and you get sucked up. Into, and I think that's the beautiful part about we we can we can talk about your journal. And it's interesting because the B, right? The B, according to to the lure, right? We're talking about alternate dimensions, heaven, other realities. Well, the B is an interesting one because the B is allegedly one of the animals that wasn't changed when man got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The bee stayed the same, and maybe that's why Masons use it in their symbology, the beehive, the bee, where you have the 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 hexa the hex hexagram, right? The hexagram? Hexagon, yeah. Hexagon where it also forms the cube. And yep. the beekeeper occupation is one of the longest living occupations of the the vibration of the wings, man. Hell That's yeah. wild, bro. And another fun fact is I had uh, Chaz on Chaz of the Dead on, and we talked shout about that because he did a lot of shout out, dude. He had a lot of a lot of work on bees. And he talked about that uh, some fun facts, like that um, bees are more efficient when they're carrying pollen, meaning they're lighter when they're carrying something than when they're not. Like it's fascinating. Also, the uh, you know, the bumblebee and how it resonates chamber and how it really flies on more of a levitation than an actual powered flight from wings and it's fascinating uh, when you really look into the bee, man. And yes, like you said, beekeepers have the longest lives because of the vibration that the bees hum at in their hive. It's a like a 528 hertz. It's like one of the best vibrations you can be on um, to settle your heart. And don't quote me on the hertz, but it's something phenomenal. Yeah. And that's what it has to do is the resonance of being in proximity of those wings doing that in harmony together. It's and- fascinating. The 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 bee being more efficient when it's carrying a load. Well, trucks, semi trucks, they're at their full braking capacity when they're fully loaded at their gross vehicle weight, eighty thousand pounds. So yeah. it's kind of you know like you, it's kind of paradoxical. Like what you you're heavier. Like no no, they're meant they're designed to break best when they're carrying a load, right? So yep. it's interesting. And so journaling, I think I don't do it enough. I do take notes by hand, and I think that letterism is the thing. I think that literature is magical in a way. I think they're taking, again, they're trying to build realities on top of the one. They want us in nested reality. So by the time you know it, we're going to put a, we're going to overlay a reality over ours right now. And then when we're in that reality, we're going to probably overlay another one inside that one. Cause you're going to be able to buy power ups in the other one. So those are your, that's your overlaid reality. And then add infinitum all the way down. Well, 
they're taking us away from writing by hand. There are no more pencil. I forgot what a pencil looked like until my son started going to school. I didn't know, you, you know, when you sharpen a pencil, I haven't seen a pencil sharpener in, in forever. And Dude, I bought a, one of those old school crank ones that we used to have in elementary school. You can get them on Amazon. I have one attached to my art desk back there. So for that reason, the journaling is powerful. Carl Jung encouraged his patients to write their own red books and do all these different things. Can we talk a little bit about the power of writing and how special it is? Be honored, dude. Thank you um, for wanting to talk about that. Yes. And so the journals, first of all, are um, a series of something that I drew. And so this is a drawing. So this is a by hand. Yes, it's a repeated page, but I, I drew the motherfucker. So this is what a basic uh, layout will look like when you open the journal. Now, there's an instruction page, which I'll show you here in a minute. But to fill it out, I really wanted to make sure that all these little nodes and things like that were in there and that you could um, customize this thing as much as you wanted. And so I'll, I'll show you that as well. So there's 10 points on this thing. And I really meant for it to be filled out in color. And actually, I've gone much further. This is my sample when I need to fill out a new one. Um, so I meant for this to be filled out in color. The outsides are all hollow like this because I used to draw this every morning, this little design with these little nodes and things like that. My little date constellation always looked like that. My Monday, my 9, 18, 23 right there. Uh, you have little counters and things like that that you get to customize, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but there are mainly, like I said, 10 points. And so what I would do every day was I track the moon, I track my reading progress. I then would uh, ask myself four questions with daily design. I had a mantra or a thought of the day. I then have my gratitude, any of my now and noteworthies up here, any of my conversation with self, what was going on, maybe day before, whatever, and then any of my goals that I was working on down here. Then I had little node sections where I would note uh, consistency with time and nature and all that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to do a full scale, hey, this is things you can do. Uh, also, I would release and attract things. So things I would be getting off my mind, nonsense, small mind, thinking and actions. Get that out and I cross it off, right? But then I am calling in you know, aligned opportunities, inspired action, focused vision, all those kinds of things, right? So it's a it's a way for you to just keep mental tabs on yourself. Now, like you said, the outside here... Um, it's it, the cover is beautiful. This is Janine Burgess, and she's joining us for some live art things that we're going to implement on the show now uh, that we're about to start recording here. And then ME uh, is the name of the journal. Now, there's five in the series, and I'll tell you why they're different. But ME stands for Mindful Expansion, right? But uh, this expansion series goes far, and you can see the journals behind me here. But ME was very important to me because I wanted you to always feel like you were working on me, right? You're, this is a relationship with you. This is about you figuring out who you are. And so you're being me from your perspective, you are being you, right? And so when you focus on this and you choose yourself first, which is what this is all about, there were several things in here where I set the tone as it were. There are seven things and places to note them off. In the morning, I just, like I said, came up with this journaling practice. I started using it for a few months, got tired of drawing it every morning. And so I wanted to have a book that I, and I knew I could go through Amazon to do it. I'm a publisher. And so then I just decided to do it well and like have really cool uh, pages with really cool inspiring quotes from a bunch of awesome people and kind of give you this set the tone idea to where every morning when you wake up, you have that opportunity to really um, take control of your life. And even in here um, in the choose you first section, there's a St. Ignatius Loyola is quoted in regards to the importance of the early stages of cognition and programming as it applies to the developing mind of a young human. Here's the quote. Give me a child until he is seven years old and I will show you the man. Uh, and so that's the point is treat each new day as a new life and give yourself that moment, that little six to seven year old time period, which means that first part of your day to choose you first. Now, there's an evening version of this and I'll show you about that in, in a minute. But I, I chose this as my morning practice because I get up early, all those things. So my set the tone in the morning, the seven things that I am consistent about to the best of my ability is no phone for the first hour. I'm not being bombarded by emails, um, anything, right? Uh, water before caffeine, very important. Positive self-talk. Start your day with the, hey, dude, you're crushing. You know, you've gotten this far. You're doing the best you can with the information you got, and you're crushing. Um, your reading practice, I read in the morning. Um, that's what I do. Um, a walk in nature, my journaling practice, and then my physical commitments. Now to that, I was thinking, well, I mean, physical commitments don't have to be a workout. If you don't want to, like, work out, work out, that's fine. 
part of the thing that I did to just start consistency in my behavior with discipline was I just did a silly little, okay, well, I'll do my age in push-ups. And I started this when I was 40 years old. I'll do 40 push-ups every day. Okay, how hard can that be? It's, it sucks. Okay, I'll be honest with you. Um, because there's days you don't want to do it, but that's not the point. The point is because of how easy it is. You can do 10 now, 10 later, 10 right. And you never do that, by the way. You always bang 40 out. And so to keep this consistent thing that I didn't want to do, uh, I made a little knob for it in my journal. And I said, okay, every day you do this, fill this in and keep a tab, keep that number running. And when that number needed to reset to one, I felt like a turd. I was like, you can't do 40 push it, you know what I mean? And so not in a judgmental way, but it was a visual way for me to keep track of myself and to keep myself accountable because you're your own accountability buddy. Now, in that, uh, there's some nodes, is as I call them. Now, in the beginning of the book, it'll show you that there's a node section where there's a sample section because there's all these little circles and stuff running around the journal. Now, they're there so that you can maximize your amount of information that you can store on a page. And so what I did was, is this is at the front of it. It's a sample page, but at the back, you're given, uh, I think, two, three in this volume. I think we're limiting it to two in the ones later because we have other pages. But you are given an actual page uh, two pages where you can just fill this out to your heart's content. You can say, actually, I want this node to mean this thing. I want this, you know, what is this? Intimacy tracker. Uh, this is the amount of partners. Um, yeah, the amount of how much you're banging uh, and then hand solo if you're doing it by yourself there. So you can assign all of these to be whatever you want, right? Um, same thing with your moon tracker. If you don't want to do a moon tracker, do um, a different phase tracker, anything you want, right? So this is my set the tone in the morning. If I fill all those in and keep a number running, I know that I've got, you know, my water before caffeine, my no phone, my workout, my walk in nature, all of those things. And all I do is go, yep, 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 yep. Keep that number going. How many days have I been consistent with my journal or anything you want, right? If the, How many days have I been consistent with just the gratitude part of it? 88 days. Awesome. Keep it going. You know, whatever. Then uh, your age and pushups and your physical commitments. Fill this out for age and pushups, sit-ups and lunges. How many days are you consistent? Uh, your temperature. You can do a whole weather tracking thing here. Now, all this, the moon, the weather, the much, all this really plays into a big picture of who you are. How consistently are you getting out in nature? Are you being consistent with your goals? Do you have a habit tracker? How many days do you quit drinking or porn? Like, track your, you know, but you can just put a little number here and color it in. And nobody knows what the you're talking about. It's just for you. But there's an expansive way that you can go about this. And this is just the first one. The second one's on the drawing table. Uh, volume two is uh, better. Uh, this one, though, is incredible. I'm, I'm very proud of this. I use this daily. Mine is right here. And actually, you can put, I put these little nodes on the side so you can put um, what volume you're in for the year and what year. So you have all these different little colored nodes and stuff like that. You have the shout outs and stuff. But then... You have the other journals as well. That's just the mindfulness one. That's just the one where uh, you go through deliberately and say, okay, this one's for, I'm going to track my this every day. In the back of that one, there are lined pages. There's just blank, you know, lined pages. I drew those two. And they're just simply because um, I journal, I draw, I uh, want some extra space to do some stuff. So I just came up with a thing to where you can do a little consolation. You can note it however you want but I did hand draw all this on an architecture table out there. And you guys can see uh, some quick videos of this on um, my Instagram, uh, Expanding Reality 369. And uh, it's just got some examples of this. Now, that then will lead you to the fact that there is another journal. This one is IE. If you remember the ME from the first, IE is for introspective expansion. It also means, in other words, literarily. And so this is our literary journal. This is the one where... We invited a bunch of people to uh, submit some quotes. It'll show you the other journals in the series. Um, it also tells you that there's a sample of volume two of this series in the back of this journal. So you get an entire journal of that, lists whatever you want, and then you run through the journal, and it's over 200 pages. I think all of these are minimum 284, uh, so you get a hell of a journal out of it. And then also, when you get to the back of it, it'll show you and give you a sample of IE volume two which is simply a different design. So there's no sort of like, hey, do this, then do that, then do that. We're just offering a bunch of different journals uh, for whatever people want to do. Now, same thing here. I use these personally. I've got my events going in one. I've got publishing going in another. I've got all of these things, and I made them so I could use them. This brings you to IE2. If you like this one, 
because you use the sample pages in the back and you're like, dude, that's a badass book. I think I'd like a fuller version of that. You've got it. And then IE3, which would be the third version of it, will be out soon. And all the co- all the custom covers and everything like that are done by these amazing artists that we shout out. This is a real community project. We get quotes in the literary ones from artists that I love, we uh, authors that I love. We get um, quotes in the Mindfulness and Wisdom Journal from philosophers and thinkers and authors that I love. Uh, our CE, our creative expansion, I'll show you in a minute. But then you have, you know, another version. Maybe you want to go six by nine, you know, long with it. And so we have just different versions for you to customize your whatever you want. Um, we have the wisdom expansion one, which this is the evening version of this one. It's a direct inverse, actually. So M-E for the morning and W-E for the evening, right? Upside down. Wisdom expansion, mindful expansion. So you have those. And then finally, we get to the third part in the series. For now, we have many other things coming with this series, but CE or creative expansion. And this one's for our artists. This is for the, it's essentially a sketchbook. It's a blank, uh, cream papered, thick sketchbook. But at the very beginning of it, um, we show you the other journals in the series. Uh, we give you a coloring page to hop in and just do whatever you want with. And then we feature several um, amazing artists and their work at the very beginning of this thing so that you can actually take a look at people's work and go, holy, shit, that's amazing. We also feature a quote from the artist as well as their name. And then in the back, it shows you how to find all these folks. And then you have someone like Brad O'Connell here. This guy is now doing our live series because this version of the book, Creative Expansion, we're now doing on the show. We have some of these folks coming to do live art on the show with us as we're recording episodes. So we featured different artists up top so that before you go into the sketchbook series, you can be like, holy, shit, this was awesome. There's some coloring book pages in there. Um, we have just all sorts of stuff. Uh, volume two of this will be out very soon. And, you know, there's just some awesome art by some amazing people. So that essentially is the journal series. I'm honestly grateful you let me talk about it. Thank you. Yeah, dude, I, I was drawn in by the cover, and I see you got some. So the other ones, they're not out yet, or they are? So we have uh, three more literally on the way. There's an ISBN issue uh, challenge or opportunity in disguise is how I'd like to put it with Amazon right now, which is where we are, but we did just get our proof in from Barnes & Noble. So we're actually going wide with this. We publisher talk, uh, Thomas knows all this. Shit. We have our own ISBNs, or we have our mm-hmm. ability to not, you know, you know, you know this, you've, you've got books out. So we did that so we could go wide, um, and we're doing that. But right now they're on Amazon, and they're in two different formats, the paperback and the hardback, uh, and there's way more coming. Like, that's just scratching the surface, man. Right and now we've got one ready to go for the next volume. Yeah, I'm going to start using this because it's actually pretty dope now that you explained it to me because it is kind of over- overwhelming when you first pick it up, and you're like, what? what is going on? It's super busy, yeah. but how you said, use it how you want. You know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have a structure to it, similar to our conversation that we were having today, where it's like, go out, explore, open your mind, expand your reality, if you will, to Come where on. you're able to accept other, <laughs> other ideas, other temporary truths. And where can people find these, Brandon? Right now, Amazon, uh, you can run through there. It's just the expansion series on Amazon and that's where they can be found. Now you can find the publishing house. It's Ridiginal Publishing, R-I-D-I-G-I-N-A-L. Uh, and that's on Amazon or on um, uh, Instagram right now. We have a little site going there with not all on it, but we're we're just getting started. Honestly, we've been too busy publishing to and creating to uh, market. But uh, Redigital, and this is again is going to be accompanying the website that'll be out soon. The publishing, the website, and the show will all be found on this, or the events, publishing, and show will all be found on the same website. But you could find Redigital. Yes, it is a word I made up. It's not going to be. There's probably only going to be this out there. R-I-D-I-G-I-N-A-L, and it means ridiculously original. Uh, Instagram there, but Amazon right now is where you can find those, and uh, they'll be going wide, Barnes Noble, all that kind of stuff, very, very soon. Have you noticed a difference in anything when you started using it? Like, have you noticed more synchronicities or things lining up? Because I love the idea of using it as a sort of grimoire, if you will, leave, like how you said, crossing things out, leaving it in the pages, Yep. and some yep. sort of mystical magical way even if you're not into that kind of stuff but yeah yeah and and, you see there fear lack imposture scarcity and doubt and it's crossed out and that's that's made for a point and then also i've got a meter up here so you could see how many days you've been consistent but also how many mind parasites you've been battling let's say Mm -hmm. that this hasn't been easy 
and that it's been a challenge to write these words and cross them out. And it's been an even bigger challenge to look down here at hope. Now, if that's the case, then rail that bitch out. Let him, let yourself know that on this day, that whatever conditions existed, you felt like shit, we're having a tough time with this. And you can do this simply by the meter up here. Now, another thing is a meter next to your moon. What I found to answer your question very directly is I found that new moon used to be a time where I just could not get my shit together. It was my time of the month, as I called it. My wife's, you know, we've been together 13 <laughs> years. And she goes, oh, it's new moon. You know, make sure you're scheduling light. And it's just an observation that I kind of turn into a social turd at that time. Now, what I've discovered is, is that that's my power time of the month, meaning I should be in, in the studio doing this, not on interviews. Mm. I should be doing this, not in public, right? So what it is, is it's about alchemizing yourself and knowing your cycles. My cycle, just me personally, was a new moon. And so I wanted to make sure a moon tracker was in there. And it's the first thing I do every time. I'll then write like what time I woke up because maybe that changes. I've also got mood and energy trackers here. So if you've got an energy level that's a little low on that day, maybe that's why these mind parasites got in. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're writing here about how, you, how much you drank last night, how your energy is low, how your mood's low, and how you're getting a lot of mind parasites. Full moon maybe, or not full moon, so you know you can rule that out. And then you're just like, oh, maybe it's behavioral. Uh, maybe my gratitude's a little off. Maybe, you know, I'm I'm not loving myself enough. Like, I'm not answering these questions to the fullest of my ability. And so different things like that, and you'll be able to see it. I can look back because I've been using this since I published it, and actually long before. I've got a, a literal lined one that I just drew uh, for a year and a half. There's actually two journals that I just have designed, and they changed constantly because I was improving on it and changing it. And then it, I got to this point, and even after using this for a year, Less than a year. I just published in September. So less than a year of using this, I'm already ready for version two. I've got volume two on the on the uh, table now. And so it's it's fascinating how much this allows you to grow, but also how much you notice about yourself. And maybe you didn't before. And like I said, this is, you know, there's a quote that starts this entire series in the very first book. And it's from Abraham Hicks. Feel how you want about what she represents or does. But the quote is, when people ask you, what have you done? The only thing that you'll be able to say to them that is of any use to them is, I figured out my relationship with me. That's the whole point of this, man. If it is a perception game, if it is here to apprehend you, then be unfuck withable. Not in the sense that you'll fall for any rabbit hole to go down or that you'll entertain any little idea to your self detriment or to the expenditure of your energy and compromise of your boundaries, but really look at yourself and say, where am I at? What is my relationship with me? How do I feel about things? Why do I tolerate that in my life? It's a great reflective tool that I found. Like I said, I, I made it for me. I got tired of drawing it. And if other people want to use it too, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I think it's a good way to put into practice a lot of the things that we talk about because we always talk about, you know, how how all these things are so great, but how esoteric Eddie talks about, like, are you, what are you doing with this knowledge? Yeah. So at least apply do some, knowledge. Uh, yeah, apply the knowledge. I love it, Brandon. Dude, thank you for coming on. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate you being here with me today. And tell the listeners where they can find you. Once again, I'll have to have you back on to talk about whatever other crazy stuff comes up in this weird great. reality that we're in. Where can people find you? Uh, yes, uh, expandingrealitypodcast.com. Again, keep it in your pocket. But right now, anywhere podcasts can be found, Rockfin, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Instagram's got some fun shit on it. Go over there definitely for the publishing, Redigital Publishing 369, I believe, or at least Expanding Reality 369. It'll link you to everything else. Uh, and that's where we can be found. Go check the show out, guys. It's it's amazing if you feel so inclined and aligned. Uh, I've had, I'm a magnet for incredible people, and that's why you've been on the show. You're one of those people as well, and I feel it's my responsibility for other folks to know about those people and to know each other. So it's been an amazing and continues to be an amazing ride, and I'm seriously grateful for this, man. This is an outstanding outstanding expenditure of my time and energy and i feel wonderful about this exchange dude this was great thank you dude likewise appreciate you being here as always everyone go check him out go show him some love go subscribe to his youtube all that good stuff make sure to check me out at the one on one podcast tjojp.com patreon.com slash the one on one podcast all that good stuff call in let us know what you thought of this episode what you think of journaling what you think of writing 407 Four seven six four six zero six. I play the voicemails on the show. Four zero seven four seven six four six zero six. As always, everyone, I'll catch you on the other side. Bye.